So we hadn't actually discussed who would uh, introduce the next speaker, but I, it's a pleasure for me to introduce him. Uh, I haven't actually prepared anything, but Subhashis was a graduate student at Stanford. Uh, I had the opportunity to sit on his, his dissertation uh, defense present, uh, dissertation defense presentation. Uh, Ed McCluskey was his advisor. He went to Intel and after some period of time came back to Stanford University where he is currently uh, a teacher. He's been a leader in innovation in nanosystems and particularly adapting new approaches to computing, which he, he uh, developed and, and illustrated early on and continues to be a leader in that space. Uh, it's certainly a privilege for us to have Sebastian with us as a speaker. Uh, he is very well known as someone who understands the space and in demand as a speaker for issues related to the semiconductor technology and specifically those that look at computing activities today and in the future. And it's a pleasure to have him. And uh, I, I can also say that just as a Jeet, Sebastian has been a friend of mine since uh, he, he was still a student. Uh, he has done amazing things. Thank you very much, Bill. That that was a very, you know, I'm blushing. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you for having me. You know, uh, it's an honor to give a talk, um, and and especially, you know, I have to teach later today, and you adjusted the schedule, uh, so thank you very much. I highly appreciate that. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so today I'll be talking about what I call 21st century nanosystems for abundant data computing. I hope you can see my slides and you can hear me. If one of you could say yes, that would be great. Yes, looks good, thank you. Okay, fantastic. So uh, obviously, you know, uh, this is joint work with lots of students, collaborators and funding agencies. Without them, this work wouldn't have been possible. So I would like to take a moment and thank each one of them. And you can see there is a, a whole bunch of people. You know, I have the honor to come to this forum and make this presentation, but, but this work wouldn't have been possible without all this great work by all these people. So actually they deserve the credit. So uh, I will start off with this presentation, you know, with, uh, which is now a fairly old study by the US National Academy of Sciences. And if you have not read this study, I would very strongly encourage you to read this study. This is called the future of computing performance game over or next level. You know, from the from the from the title of this you know uh, study, you can tell what this study is about. So now, since we are talking about computing performance, first we have to define performance, right? So for this presentation, I would like to define performance as energy times execution time. Why are we picking this metric? Because there are many ways to improve energy at the cost of execution time. For example you know, you lower the voltage a lot. Uh, there are ways to improve execution time at the cost of energy. For example, you increase the voltage a lot, but there are very few ways that you can improve energy and execution time simultaneously. So that's why this is the metric that we will go by at least for this presentation. Now, since we are talking about computing performance, performance is, very strongly connected to what applications we are looking towards. So the applications that I will focus on in this presentation is what I call abundant data applications. And these abundant data applications, for example, uh, AI on large amounts of data, that's an example of abundant data application. And this abundant data application is relevant from the IoT edge all the way to the cloud. Now, when we think of these abundant data applications, there are certain characteristics of these applications. The most important characteristic is what I call the memory wall. So if you look at the pie chart shown on this slide, you will see that I have not said you know, what the pie chart stands for. It could be energy, it could be execution time. The big point over here is it doesn't really matter whether you pick energy or execution time, you see that up to 95% for example, of energy is spent trying to access the memory. And this has nothing to do with whether these are programmable processors or von Neumann processors or not. 
you have processors or you have hardware accelerators, which are not necessarily von Neumann machines, all of them have the memory valve. So if we have to get improvements in performance with respect to these abundant data applications, the first thing we have to do is to address the memory wall. And oh, by the way, the memory wall is there irrespective of the computational model you're using. Neural nets, of course, there, there is a memory wall. But if you look at other brain-inspired computing models, you see the same challenges. You know, what do you do with compute and memory? What do you do about connectivity? What do you do about energy efficiency and so on? And guess what? You know this very well that the memory wall is not the only one that we have to worry about. There are many other walls simultaneously. And two other most prominent walls are A, the power wall. Since Denard scaling has stopped you know, for more than a decade now, we have tried to figure out ways of how to get around that. That's the power wall. And the real challenge moving forward is what's shown on the you know, right panel of this slide, which is the miniaturization wall. You know, today, you know, we are at a five nanometer technology node or a three nanometer technology node. And the question is how far we are going to go, maybe up to a 0.5 nanometer technology node, we don't know, right? But clearly in this, in this current decade, some really interesting things will happen with respect to this miniaturization wall. So then the question is, how do we overcome all these walls simultaneously? the memory wall, the power wall, and uh, the miniaturization wall for sure. And any technology that we create must address these walls simultaneously. We cannot have a piecemeal solution. So which means that to improve computing performance, we have to think about not only just devices, not only just design techniques or architectures, but we have to think about a combination of device and architectural techniques. And when we target a very large improvement in performance, remember performance is defined as energy times execution time in this presentation. Let's say a thousand X improvement in performance, clearly we need new innovations. And this is where comes the notion of what I call nanosystems. So you need new nanotechnologies to create nanosystems, but new nanotechnologies could mean not only new devices, but also new ways of doing fabrication or new kinds of sensors, for example. And when you are successful in integrating these new kinds of devices using new kind of fabrication techniques and so on, what is absolutely crucial, and I want to draw your attention over here, is that you must be able to build new architectures that are not possible with existing technologies. If you just take existing architectures and retrofit them, which means just replace you know, existing devices with new devices, you will still continue to be stuck by the fundamental bottlenecks of existing architectures. So it is absolutely crucial that when we talk about new nanotechnologies, we enable new architectures, which in turn enable new applications. And as I said earlier, for our case, the new application domain is this what I call abundant data applications. So if you think about computing today, in spite of massive progress over the past 60 years, computing today is fairly interesting. You got uh, this compute chip that's shown over here, which is essentially a two dimensional uh, you know, space of transistors. Yeah, our computing chips go to the third dimension, but that's for interconnects. And then you got the memory that is, you know, you got a memory chip there which is quite far from the compute chip. And as I was talking about the memory wall, you spend all your time and energy going back and forth between the compute chip and the memory chip. And remember, this is irrespective of whether you're talking about programmable processors or hardware accelerators. Instead, what you would like to do is something like this. You would have layers of you know, this is always creates trouble, this animation on Zoom, but I will try to see what I can do. Otherwise I'll get out and go to the next slide, okay? I'll you know, go to the next slide and I'll come back. So. 
Instead, what you need is you need layers of efficient logic. You need layers of dense memory intertwined, interleaved with the layers of efficient logic. You can actually have a layer of, for example, sensors for increased functionality. But if there was one point that I would like, your, like to draw your attention to, that would be this, uh, yeah, this, uh, this animations always create trouble with uh, uh, Zoom, sorry about that. So if there is one thing that I would like to draw your attention to, that would be this ultra dense 3D vertical connectivity that are connecting these various layers. So remember, we have the memory wall, we have the power wall, we have the miniaturization wall, and you see that how this notion, this concept, this, this is what we call our next concept or N3XT concept of computation immersed in memory, it simultaneously addresses those three walls. You have layers of dense memory interleaved with layers of efficient logic that addresses the memory wall. The fact that you have ultra dense 3D that addresses both the miniaturization wall and the memory wall. And the fact that you have very efficient and dense logic and memory that addresses the power wall. Now, this kind of a concept is impossible with business as usual. So a few years back, we started working on this next concept. And by now, you know, we actually have actual demonstrations that I will talk about in this presentation. I, you can see the cast of characters that have contributed to this next concept. And I was very glad to see that Professor Ken Goodson, who is shown over here, he will give a presentation later today on thermal challenges moving forward. So, uh, and next forms the basis for this paper that, you know, I had the honor to co-author with few of my colleagues on a density metric for semiconductor technology. And you will see that how these two things, this concept of next and dense 3D and so on is intricately connected with this kind of a new way, a new density metric for uh, quantifying the advances in semiconductor technology. I would very strongly encourage you to read this paper. It's not a very long paper, uh, but what it makes, it, it makes a case for moving forward instead of calling our technologies five nanometer, three nanometer, two nanometer, and so on, to express, the to express our technology using this tuple of what we call logic density, memory density, and connection density, DL, DM, and DC. Okay, so as I was talking about, next is a concept, and there can be many implementations of next. I will touch upon some of those later in this presentation. Now, obviously, when somebody looks at the next concept, they always think about their own ideas about how to implement next. Since I have the honor to give this presentation, I will actually spend a little time talking about how we are implementing next today. At Stanford, we are focusing on one dimensional carbon nanotube transistors and 2D FETs for implementing the efficient logic layers in next. For the memory layers, we are focusing on two memory technologies, MRAM and three-dimensional resistive RAM, because they have very different and complementary properties with respect to density, retention, and endurance, for example. But I would like to draw your attention to three really important things in our next implementation. First of all, we do not use any TSVs or through silicon vias to implement our next concept right now. Instead, we use ultra dense fine grained vias through monolithic three dimensional integration. That's the first important point. I will touch upon this later in this presentation. The second important point is, even though you do not see silicon anywhere here, right? You know, this next concept and our next implementation is fully compatible with silicon technologies. Actually, I will show you next implementation in actual commercial silicon foundries today. And number three, when you think of dense 3D integration, you think of thermal challenges. Oh my gosh, how are we going to get the heat out from those upper layers? And that's where I think Professor Goodson's presentation uh, later today will, I'm sure, touch upon some of those. But let me tell you one thing. 
logic on the upper layers that does not necessarily mean that you will have a major thermal issue. In the first generation of our next architectures, the logic on the upper layers is mostly used for memory accesses, memory access circuits, memory controllers, and the network on a chip to you know, route memory traffic. The heavy duty compute in our first generation of the next architecture, the heavy duty compute is still running at the bottommost layer next to the heat sink. So from a thermal standpoint, that's not a problem. You do not need special techniques on the upper layers uh, for that purpose. Now, when miniaturization, when two-dimensional miniaturization really stops, that's when you have to start thinking about implementing heavy duty compute on the upper layers of the next architecture. That would be the second generation of the next architecture. And that's where thermal would be extremely important. And that's why we are collaborating with Professor Goodson on those thermal challenges. And this next actually forms the basis for a major DARPA program. It's called the DARPA 3DSOC program. And I have shown the cast of characters over here. I'm very proud that Professor Max Schillacher of MIT, uh, my former stu PhD student, uh, he is a PI. And Professor Ananta Chandrakasan from MIT is also part of the 3DSOC program. From Stanford, the cast of characters are Professor Boris Mormon, Professor Philip Wong, Professor Simon Wong, and myself. Uh, and Skywater Technology Foundry is the commercial silicon foundry that's actually have implemented these technologies, the carbon nanotubes, the resistive RAM, and the monolithic 3D. And Nano Integris is a carbon nanotube supplier. So what I'm going to do next is over the next few slides, I will go through the component technologies of Next. And that also forms the basis for the DARPA 3D SOC. First, we start with carbon nanotube transistors. Why are we looking at carbon nanotube transistors? Well, carbon nanotubes are nanocylinders of graphene with fantastic properties. When you grow carbon nanotubes on a substrate or you transfer carbon nanotubes from one substrate to another substrate and you create those source, gate, and drain contacts, you create what is called a carbon nanotube field effect transistor. So the carbon nanotubes are acting as a channel for that field effect transistor. A joint collaborative work between Stanford and IMEC, we have shown that when you actually implement uh, full processors, not a NAND gate, not an inverter, but full processors using carbon nanotube field effect transistors, you can get very significant benefits in energy delay product. And even more importantly, uh, people have actually demonstrated working carbon nanotube uh, processors, for example, in real life. For a very long time, inherent imperfections in carbon nanotubes, for example, misposition nanotubes, metallic nanotubes, and carbon nanotube variations prevented researchers from uh, demonstrating actual carbon nanotube-based digital systems using an approach called the imperfection immune paradigm that we started at Stanford. Uh, and now uh, MIT and Analog Devices, they published a paper in Nature in 2019. They actually showed a carbon nanotube Fed-based full RISC V microprocessor, a full with full CMOS logic. So lots of progress are happening in the domain of carbon nanotube transistors. Similarly, for memories, we are talking about resistive memories. And the idea of using these dense resistive memories is to have a large amount of on-chip memory. Resistive memories are very good with respect to non-volatile system operation. Uh, for the first time, we have been able to demonstrate multiple bits per cell inside resistive memory arrays, and even resistive memory structures that are beyond the conventional 1T1R structures. These are called 1TNR structures. As you know that in resistive memory, the, the value the memory is, you know, actually the resistance is acting as the memory, which means that you have to worry about how do you set and reset and how do you achieve endurance. And we have been able to show 10 years of continuous edge AI using this resistive memories. So let's look into the next level of details of what we have been able to demonstrate. As I was saying that this is a collaborative project with Stanford and CELAT 
in 2019, we were able to demonstrate for the first time. Hello. A, yes, hello. Somebody's talking. Uh, in 2019, we were able to demonstrate for the first time, uh, this is a collaborative project between uh, Stanford and CELAT, uh, resistive RAM-based memories, full arrays with multiple bits per cell, with up to three bits per cell. And we were able to demonstrate also working systems, you know, neural net inference that would achieve 2.3x more accurate inference thanks to optimized weight encoding of neural nets that takes into account how this, uh, you know, multiple bits per cell RM behaves in actual hardware. And I'm very proud to also show that this is a 2021 result on the right panel of this slide. This is a collaborative work between Stanford and Skywater Technology Foundry. For the first time in the industry, we have been able to show 1T8R structures. Just think of the density, it's not 1T1R. If you have a 1T1R structure of resistive RAM, you are stuck by the footprint of the transistor while the resistive RAM is on top of the transistor. To make up for the footprint, we are now packing eight resistive RAM cells on the on the footprint of uh, the single transistor. And inside each of those resistive RAM cells, we are programming four bits per cell. So one theater arrays with four bits per cell. This is, you know, in, uh, this is going to appear in the electron device letters uh, in the March issue this 2021. So this is a very recent result. So that's for resistive memories. And then, as I mentioned earlier, that we have to think about three-dimensional integration. Now, when you think of three-dimensional integration, the world mostly thinks about what are called TSVs or through silicon vias. These are the big fat pillars. I liken the through silicon vias to, uh, for example, the three bridges that connect between San Francisco and Berkeley. And that's why every time you drive between these two busy cities, you're always stuck in traffic. That's exactly what's going on with our compute systems Thanks to Moore's law, we have lots of transistors on the compute city, lots of transistors in the memory city, but these you know, big fat uh, pillars, these through silicon vias, these are the three bridges between compute and memory and you're always stuck in traffic. Instead, what I would like is millions of bridges between you know, San Francisco and Berkeley. How would you implement those millions of bridges inside an integrated circuit? The densest vertical connectivity known to humankind are perhaps the vertical metal vias that we already use in today's chips for connecting metal layers. How can we make use of those back end of line vias for connecting many layers so that we have, we have very dense 3D of interleaved layers of logic and memory? Well, there comes the idea of monolithic three-dimensional integration how can we put memory and logic on the upper layers of an integrated circuit chip? Using conventional silicon technologies, you cannot quite do that because it takes 1000 degrees C to build a silicon transistor. And once you build a silicon transistor on the upper layer, everything else that you built underneath would be severely damaged. This is where comes carbon nanotubes and resistive RAM. I didn't tell you that you can inherently build these carbon nanotube fits and this resistive RAM memory naturally at a very low temperature of less than 400 degrees C. So naturally they enable a monolithic three-dimensional integration, which means they enable a new architecture. Remember I was talking about that earlier when I was talking about nanosystems. So these technologies enable a new architecture, which means that in addition to their device level benefits of CN FETs and resistive RAM, now you get a new architectural benefit that you cannot get with existing silicon technologies. And at Stanford, uh, a few years back, we actually demonstrated that kind of a 3D nanosystem. Some of you have seen this before. This is a repeat. Still, this is the most complex three-dimensional nanosystem that anybody has demonstrated today. So we were using carbon nanotubes for computing logic, a machine learning accelerator. We were using SVM classification, a megabit of resistive RAM, uh, millions of sensors because we wanted to collect data from the external world and very dense vertical connectivity. And this 3D nanosystem 
could go and uh, grab abundant data at terabytes per second from the external world, store it in the on-chip resistive RAM, and perform computation in situ for extensive and accurate classification. This is the dream of AJI that everybody talks about, and this has been demonstrated in real hardware. So I could end this presentation at this point and say, well, you know, my way or highway, I showed you these technologies, you know, and I showed you, you know, like how we can build actual hardware, but I know better. I stated this right in the beginning of my presentation that next is a concept. And what I showed you until now is our specific implementation of next using this logic memory and integration technologies. But there are many brilliant people in this forum, and I'm sure that you have your ideas about how to implement next. So that's why what is really important is what I call a next simulation framework. Uh, that would take, for example, abundant data applications, for example, using frameworks such as TensorFlow or PyTorch, and would also be able to understand heterogeneous nanotechnologies for logic, memory, and integration. And then we should be able to do a system level analysis, explore various architectures with respect to energy, execution time, thermal, lifetime, and so on, and also provide a physical design infrastructure, because you might think that something works very well architecturally, but when you have to place and route that darn thing, you find that it does not really work. So I'm very proud that one of my former postdocs actually implemented such a next simulation framework. And as a result, we can show that next brings massive benefits for a wide range of applications from graph analytics to traditional machine learning to neural nets and so on. For example, on the left panel, you see that you get very significant benefits with respect to both energy and execution time. So in the range of a thousand X improvement in energy delay product, our notion of performance for a wide range of applications and very importantly, without having to change the software. On the right panel, what I'm showing is Next simulation framework also allows you to co-explore the interplay between technology, architectures, and applications. For example, you might say that looks bashish. You know, I do not want to use monolithic 3D integration. I want to use a conventional uh, TSV that has five micron pitch. How much benefit am I going to get? And you see the answer over here. Versus if I used a hundred nanometer pitch, for example for a very dense 3D integration, you see that you get very significant benefits. This co-exploration of technology, architecture, and applications, and very importantly, deriving technology targets from application needs is the need of the hour. And we absolutely need to enable this moving forward if we want to talk about heterogeneous integration, which is the topic of this workshop. I'm very proud to also say that you know, for a very long time, we have been building these hardware prototypes in the lab. For example, the three-dimensional three nanosystem that I was talking about earlier, you know, we also demonstrated at, at ISSC 2018, what is called hyperdimensional computing. This is a computational model for machine learning, for example. MIT has demonstrated 3D major and so on and so forth. But the question had always been, would this work in a real fab? And I'm very proud to say that this carbon nanotube fits, the resistive RAM, and the monolithic 3D, all these technologies are working today in a commercial silicon foundry, thanks to DARPA, the DARPA 3D SOC program. So this is a collaborative work between MIT, Stanford, and the Skywater Technology Foundry. So once you actually enable these new architectures, and new nanosystems using these new nanotechnologies, the opportunities are enormous. There are opportunities for new kinds of nanosystems, what I call a cross layer exploration between device circuit and architecture. I already mentioned this notion of dense compute in 3D and thermal solutions that would be necessary for the second generation of the next architectures. And I'm sure Professor Goodson will talk about that you know, some of those aspects later today. So I won't touch upon uh, this dense computeless thermal, but you can ask me questions and I'm happy to answer. 
And even there are new software optimizations and new architecture optimizations uh, that you can now enable because of these new nanosystems that we can build. I won't have time to talk about all this in the next you know, uh, you know, 14 or 15 minutes that I have. Uh, you know, instead, I will just focus on this first aspect, which is cross-layer device circuit and architecture. So what is a dream chip we all want to build, given all this, right? So if you think of AI workloads or graph workloads and so on, the dream chip that we all want to build is all compute and all memory are on one chip, readily accessible very quickly at very low energy, right? That would be the dream chip. So as shown you know, in this figure over here, you have a massive on-chip memory and you know, I'm just giving the dimensions n times m, you will see why. You have the compute, you have some data buffers, that would be your dream chip. But this dream chip is invisible because even though I have done all my 3D integration and so on, the workloads are running much faster than my rate of integration. So this dream chip is a moving target and I can never keep up. So in some sense, this dream chip is invisible. And when this dream chip is invisible, what does the world do? Well, you know, you have this compute chip, instead of the amount of memory n times m that I was talking about earlier, what the world is doing is that they will have an amount of memory m on the compute chip. And you have this off chip memory, which has the amount of memory n minus one times m. So overall memory in the system is still n times m, but you got the memory wall over here that I started this presentation with. Right. And you spend all your energy and execution time going back and forth between the computer and the memory chip. So question is, can we do something else that is enabled by these new nanosystems uh, that I was talking about earlier in our next project? And here comes the idea of illusion. This just got published in Nature Electronics in, in the January issue. So I would strongly encourage you to you know, read the paper. This is a collaborative work between Stanford, CELAT, Facebook, and NTU Singapore. And the idea over here is that instead of that you know, compute chip and the memory chip, you have multiple compute chips, each compute chip having its memory M. And of course, it has its compute and data buffers and so on. And I have N such chips. So my total memory in my systems is N times M, but I have built a distributed system. And these chips are connected by an interchip network, but here are three really important points. First of all, you need enough on-chip memory per chip. You cannot have only one bit of memory on one chip and create this illusion. I will define what illusion is very soon. So you, have, you need to have enough on-chip memory that is enabled by all this 3D integration and all that stuff that I was talking about earlier you need to be able to quickly turn these chips on and off. That's where the non-volatility that you get by, for example, the resistive RAM becomes very important. And number three, once you have enough on-chip memory and you can turn chips on and off very quickly, that enables spatial mapping so that the interchip network is very sparsely used. And as a result, you get this notion of illusion, which means not only can you perform the task and produce correct results, but your overall energy of this illusion system, the overall system, including everything that's shown on this slide, your overall energy will be within 5% of the dream chip that you cannot build. And your overall execution time or throughput will be within 5% of the dream chip that you cannot build. And this is something, this kind of an illusion is not possible with traditional multi-chip parallelization, although the notion of using multiple chips to do computation has been known for a very long time, since the 1960s, I guess, you know, when, for example, ILIAC-4 was happening. So how did we demonstrate this illusion system in that Nature Electronics paper? So we were very thankful to our Leti colleagues that we actually had silicon CMOS compute, commercial silicon CMOS, and on top of that, let you put their Leti resistive RAM. And that's like one of these chips. And we have multiple of these chips that's shown over here. And as a result, you know, uh, what we show, and you should go and read the 
uh, the natural electronics paper, in actual hardware, we built an eight chip illusion system, which would mean, and we were able to achieve, as I promised, the overall energy of the illusion system for this AI workloads is within 4% of the dream energy and you cannot build the dream chip. And the overall execution time of the illusion system is within 5% of the dream chip that you cannot build. Just think of the implication of something like this. So you are creating this eight chip illusion system to create the notion of that dream chip, which is equivalent to three generations of so-called Moore's law, if we think of in terms of Moore's law today. So, you know, you are creating, you know, a, 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 a three or five nanometer technology using a 10 nanometer technology node, for example. Using a 10 nanometer technology node, you are giving the density and all the performance benefits of a three nanometer technology node, for example. So this has very deep implications on your workshop, which is heterogeneous integration. These chips are heterogeneous because they have heterogeneous technologies of logic, memory, and integration. And the integration piece is how you integrate these individual chips. But the important point is, it's not just some hodgepodge, hokey pokey integration. And then you say, you know, I have multiple chiplets and I'm just running something. You have to be very careful. This is the interplay between applications, algorithms, and the hardware architecture and the technologies. That interplay allows you to create this illusion. And this illusion is a great opportunity moving forward. You know, and I take this slide that my uh, colleague, Professor Philip Wong shows. This takes you out of the miniaturization tunnel. As I was talking about in the beginning of the presentation, we are have, going to have a miniaturization wall very soon. And what would get us out of that miniaturization tunnel is this notion of illusion. So I call this the new illusion scaling. So you have this very next dense 3D chips, right? These chips themselves are heterogeneous because you have CN feds, resistive RAM, for example, with monolithic 3D. And you have these multiple next chips with an efficient interchip network that is enabled by new integration techniques. And the combination of the two allows you this new illusion scaling that would not be possible with any one of these. If you did not do this dense, dense 3D, you would not be able to get next illusion. And if you do not have an efficient interchip network, you know, you, 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 know you, you, you have more trouble. So let me show you, I really think moving forward, technology is going to be very exciting. And I will spend a little time to you know, explain this slide. And I think I have five more minutes and I'll be done by then. If you look at the Y axis of this slide, of this graph, here I'm talking about more and more on-chip integration. So for the past 60 years, this is the path we followed, mostly through you know, miniaturization and moving forward, we are going to do dense 3D. So higher up you go, you have you know, more capacity, for example, for chip. So this is the tunnel that we followed for the past 60 years, the y-axis only. Moving forward, why technology is exciting is I think we are going to have a full football field because we are going to have the X axis, which is through better ways of integrating multiple chips. We are going to improve the interchip network performance. Here I'm showing gigabytes per second, bytes per picojoule, which means higher values are better. So now look at this ISO illusion lines over here. So this is a line where the energy delay product of an illusion system is within 10% of the dream chip. Remember, you cannot build the dream chip, so you build the illusion system, and the dream chip has massive benefits with respect to when compared to today's memory wall. So you're just within 10% of the EDP of the dream chip. What this line shows is that integration and interchip integration and on-chip integration are fungible. You can be anywhere on this line and you will be able to achieve this illusion EDP. If you have a way that you, know, you have a lot of on-chip integration, then you can relax your inter-chip integration strategies. But if you cannot achieve a lot of on-chip integration, you have to think of better ways of inter-chip integration so that you can achieve the illusion. That's the first one. And the second point is 
let's say I want to go from this 10% line to 1% line. On this line, the illusion EDP is within 1% of the dream EDP. How could I do that? If I did not improve my interchip integration, then you can see that I need significant improvements in on-chip integration to do that. This is for actual AI workloads. Similarly, if I did not improve my on-chip integration, I have to have significant improvements in my interchip integration to achieve that. But instead, I can actually move diagonally if I can orchestrate my on-chip integration with my interchip integration in the right ways. I can move diagonally, so with some improvements in on-chip integration and some improvements in interchip integration, I can achieve the you know one percent illusion EDP, and I can keep improving the scalability and the performance moving forward. So this is truly exciting because this is kind of a new kind of a Moore's law, if you might want to call it that way. Okay. So this is the new illusion scaling. I think that can be enabled by this heterogeneous integration roadmap. One last point I would like to make before I close my presentation. So I mostly focused on technologies. I mostly focused on architectures, this illusion and illusion scaling and so on. So one thing we cannot forget that when we create these new kinds of nano systems that I'm talking about using this heterogeneous integration, three things are going to be extremely important that we tend to forget, which means we must revolutionize validation, we must revolutionize test, we must revolutionize resilience. So I have shown two examples. On the left panel, I'm showing this work that we have been doing. This is called QED or quick error detection, system validation and test. And I was actually very happy that QED was mentioned in your heterogeneous integration roadmap. Uh, this is actual data from NXP. This was a joint study with them. They actually had an issue in post-silicon validation where it took them six months to figure out what was going wrong inside their chip. Using this QED technology, we could actually figure it out in a few seconds. And moving forward on the right panel, the point I'm trying to make is one-time testing during production may not be enough. For various reasons, I won't have the time to get into. You know, uh, you can ask me questions. Moving forward, infield test and diagnostics would be extremely important for these complex nanosystems with heterogeneous integration. And I'm very happy to see that while we published this work called CASP, you know, uh, slightly over 10 years back, it's getting a lot of traction, including there, is a recent, there was a recent Intel presentation talking about infield testing and how some of these CAS, CAS principles and philosophies are being used there. So to end this presentation, I have three points. First of all, next nanosystems are possible today. It's not some fantasy find the sky sort of a thing. It's happening in a commercial foundry with CNFETS, resistive RAM, and monolithic 3D. So to go back to the first slide that I showed, that you know, this National Academy study, is it game over or do we go to the next level? My tongue-in-cheek answer is it's game on to the next era, which is N3XT. And I think a really great opportunity moving forward is this new illusion scaling that can provide massive benefits enabled by Next for a wide range of applications. I would stop my presentation here and thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. That's great. We do have a couple of questions in the chat. Would you like me to read them to you or do you want to open Okay, the let me let, let me read, you know, uh, uh, I have a question about best of breed and HIR versus the 3D IC Pankaj. You know, hi, how are you doing? Uh, oh, it's so, been great. Yeah. Yeah, so so I actually absolutely believe this illusion that I was talking about is the key. If you look at the illusion picture that I was showing, uh, essentially what's happening is that, I'm, I'm actually going back to sharing mode, but I, can, I think I can see chat in the sharing mode as well. Yes. I have done this for my class. So, you know, I will do that. You can see my presentations again, right? Yes. I'll, I'll go can, back although to we're the seeing this. I will also the the chat. Yep, yeah. there you go. Yeah, I'll bring the chat as well here. Uh, so um, I will just go back to this one. So this is the future. It's not, you know, 3D IC or heterogeneous integration. This is 3D IC and heterogeneous integration because at the end, what you need is illusion because you need to create that illusion of the dream chip that you cannot build. And remember, 
Here, you know, already in hardware, we are showing eight chip illusion. In simulation, we have been able to show 64 chip illusion. 64 chip illusion means six generations of technologies by today's uh, uh, counts, basically. Just think of the profound impact of that. So it's not an and, uh, it's not an or, it's an and. And, yes. you know, and that's why I want to highlight this slide that I was showing Pankaj. So that's why the, uh, the, the y-axis is like 3D. And the x-axis is this heterogeneous integration of multiple chips. And you see that with the right amounts, you are on this illusion line. And as long as you are on one of these illusion lines, you can see that I have, it's fungible. I can decide how much on-chip integration I do versus how much inter-chip integration I do. And this creates, really creates a guideline for the industry, I think, moving forward of what they need to do. Yeah, so, I just want to quickly clarify yes. that my question was a little bit different. You know, the, there has been some observation even at Stanford System X mm -hmm. that the technology, material technologies for compute, memory, power management, et cetera, the materials are diverging. Oh, so, oh absolutely, yep. You know, the core concept of Next uh, that you outline which is the uh, co-placement of compute uh, and memory mm -hmm. in layers. Mm -hmm. uh, it is the one that I was asking about. Oh, I see, is, I did not realize, right. okay. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay. yes. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Let me, let me address that as well. So, uh, you know, there is a reason why we picked CNTs, resistive RAM, you know, and you know, MRAM and the monolithic 3D, right? That, you know, I kind of delved into. So we absolutely believe in those technologies. And you know, for a very long time, people used to say that, can you make these technologies work in an actual foundry? And these are actually working in an actual foundry now. Uh, but having said that, I think we have to be open-minded. So even with silicon technologies, we know this very well, that you know, the silicon technology that, is, that was used when I was in grad school is very different from the silicon technology that's being used today. So that's why I think you know, this world is going to innovate. And that's why I think there will be new materials and so on to create you know, new generations of next. But having said that one thing I believe would be important is I think it would be heterogeneous. I think it's highly unlikely that there would be this one magic material that one would find and that would do everything if that's sort of what you are asking. I think it's, you know, and, and I'm happy to delve into more details. Yeah, yeah, okay. I think, th thank you for that answer though. Yes, thank you. thank you. Okay, so the next question is from Wolf. Please consider the combination of the two chip with packaging multi Exactly correct, Wolf, you know, sort of that's exactly what I was meaning. You know, so I'm you're sorry, spot on. So I think that question was sent only to you. Could you tell us the question you're responding to? Oh, oh, oh oops, sorry. <laughs> so please consider the combination of the 3D Dream chip with packaging uh, uh, multiple Dream chips with wafer scale integration. Yes, I, you know, uh, that figure that I was showing earlier, Wolf, I was not meaning by any means that, you know, they have to be diced and then packaged. Yes, you know, if somebody had a very good way of doing wafer scale integration of this, that would be fantastic. And guess what? You know, when I was talking about this resilience, this infill test and diagnostics and repair, I was actually thinking of whether I should have, you know, another panel on repair. And I'm like, no, it's too dense. Uh, would become very important. So if you, you know, have ideas and things like that, I'm very happy to, you know, discuss with you. Uh, I don't know if Wolf is online. I'm happy to if he has any points to make. Otherwise, I'll go to Chris Bailey next. Okay, Chris Bailey, can, can you could you comment on challenges status for EDA tools and PDKs for the three D architectures? The PDKs are happening as we speak. So oh, you know okay. you you can actually go to you know uh, Skywater Technology Foundry and you can you have to sign a bunch of NDAs I guess with them and you can get the PDKs. Yes. Uh, so far as EDA tools. Uh, I'll give you three answers. First mm -hmm. of all, you know, even for the next framework, simulation framework that I was talking about, my former graduate student, Tony, he actually built uh, an EDA framework for place and route and physical design and all that using existing commercial tools that are for 2D. Uh, quite a few researchers, you know, are actually working on uh, 3D place and route and 3D physical design and so on and so forth. But a lot is happening at the physical design level. For example, as part of our DARPA 3D SOC program, mm. Professor Sankyu Lim of Georgia Tech is doing some of that work, but there are other people that are also doing you know, that work. I think that sort of work has to move, the EDA work has to move to the one level up at the architectural exploration, like what I was showing in the next simulation framework. And the third answer is, I hope that 
the EDA vendors see mm. this coming and they will jump in. Uh, so th those would be my answers. Uh, you know, Chris, you can ask me any follow-up question if you want to. No, I think that covers it. I, I, I guess it'd be very interesting to see how the tool vendors position themselves for this in, in the future. So are there tool vendors as part of HIR? I think there should be. Mm. So is there any tool vendor who wants to say anything? Okay. I'm not sure if there's a tool vendor on the call today, but they are part of the HIR roadmap. I think it would be good uh, to have yeah. engage a con in a conversation with them, I would yeah, say. Sure. Hi, uh, Zier. You hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, hi, Subash. This was a gr great presentation. Thanks a lot. And there are many points I'd like to follow up hey, with thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, but just being coming from an EDA and IP company, which is Synopsys, I, I'd like just to say that we are definitely following this closely uh, and we'll be reacting to that accordingly as well. Okay. Hey, thank this you, Yervan. Hey, good to see you, Yervan. Didn't thank see you, so you for much. a while. Thanks. Yes, that's true. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got two private questions, you know, from, you know, two people. And I wonder if I should, you know, read them out or because they're very good questions or would they not prefer, you know, whoever sent me private questions, if you could please say yes, then I could read them out because I think they're very good questions. Okay, so Anu Ramamurthy has this question that for efficient interchip network, are you referring to PCB-based connectivity or more advanced packaging? Guess what? Uh, right now, of course, we are doing PCB-based packaging. So our interchip network is really bad, but still we can get illusion. But moving forward, I absolutely mean uh, you know, uh, 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 like very advanced packaging. And I think if you take very advanced packaging of this uh, 3D ICs, this next uh, 3D, I think the world will change. And that's sort of what I'm showing on this slide. Anu, I hope you know, that answers your question. Okay, uh, the next question is from Shengmin Wen, which is, so this is calling for SOC type with better integration in one chip rather than discrete functional chiplets to packaging technology. Uh, you're sort of right. And the key point is, I would not say that whether it's discrete or SOC type, the key point is ultimately you want to achieve illusion, right? Essentially what's going on is that you have multiple chips, but the thing is if you build these multiple chips because you can integrate, but as a result, you suffer a massive performance degradation, then nobody would like that multiple chip integration, right? And that's why this illusion is so important. And yes, what we have found is as soon as you talk about illusion, you have to have each chip to have some minimum capability, right? You cannot say that, oh, each chip is going to have one bit and I'm going to just move all these one bits, you know, all over. I guess unless we can invent telepathy, you know, uh, you know that's not going to happen. You're going to spend a lot of energy and execution time. And that's where we have seen that each chip has to be very capable. And that's sort of, if you're calling an SOC type, then I would be with you. Shengmin, does it answer your question? Uh, I do not know if Shengmin you know, is still here or not. Kanath had a, has a question. Can you please comment on the yield of the CNFET RAM stack? The yield is actually extremely good. Uh, so, you know, we have working, working chips and they're working very well. So, but in general, I would actually take your question to the next level. And I think that's sort of what you are asking. The real question that you are asking is, I think, and if not, you know, please, you know, uh, you know, I, I'm happy to delve into the materials level because there is a materials aspect of it, but I do not want to get into too much of the grubby stuff unless you want me to, which is that uh, 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 the real question is, if you do 3D, monolithic 3D especially, uh, then you cannot test and integrate, right? You integrate and then test which means if one of the layers has a bad thing, then the whole thing would be gone. So this is a much kind of a bigger issue than the individual CNFETs or RAM. But if you have questions about individual CNFETs and RAM, I'm happy to answer. So as a result, this is sort of what I was meaning on this slide that moving forward, we have to also revolutionize validation, test and resilience. So we have to seriously think of resilience moving forward, which means that we have to think of interesting repair techniques. And this is where we have an opportunity. So, you know, when I was a grad student, you know, this is like, you know, almost the end of the last century, right? You know, early 2000s. Uh, 
the world was boring because if you, you, had, you just had a microprocessor. If you had a microprocessor and if, you know, like if the ALU is gone or if the instruction decoder is gone, God bless you, right? You know, you cannot do much, right? You have to put in run and say, you know, as Bill Barton said that, you know, my advisor was Professor McCloskey. And, you know, like somebody commented and said when Professor McCloskey was doing fault tolerant computing, you know, he's a pioneer of all this, right? We are, you know, st standing on, on his shoulder, a giant. You know, people would not even give him 1% additional area to do anything. They would say, oh, area is very important. You cannot even use an extra NAND gate. Versus today, you know, when we are talking about this next 3D integration, you know, you're talking about not a system on a chip, you're talking about a distributed system on a chip. You're going to have many compute elements and many memory components, right? And you're not going to have one monolithic memory array, which means that there are tremendous opportunities, even without redundancy. There are tremendous opportunities of repair. And I would like to point you to a paper that one of my students, you know, uh, Yan Jing Li, now she's a professor at the University of Chicago. She actually wrote in ITC, International Test Conference 2013. She actually showed that by using architectural features, how you can do self-repair. So this is almost like the internet, right? You know, you have so many routers and so many nodes and so on. And if one node is down, what do you do? You reuse another node to get the work done. And if you can reuse the right way, nobody is going to see the performance impact of that. And those sorts if, of if could, ways of repair would be very important. Yes, please yeah, go ahead. Subhashis, uh, my interruption is just to remind everyone that in less than three minutes, the next presentation begins. Okay, so there's a one last question you know, that I would take and I would just stop. Uh, there was a question from Bob Connor. Is there a need for new technology to address the power wall? And if so, what are the promising approaches? Obviously, you know, how we, you know, like deal with the power wall is always going to be important. The CN FETs, you know, as you can see that they give fundamental benefits in energy, you know, benefits, for example. So that is one way of improving the power wall, but that's a, you know, only one way. For example, there are people that are talking about negative capacitance techniques, for example, right, for doing things. So a lot will happen in that domain as well. So that would be my answer. And, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and uh, thank you for your attention.